so hi, my name is Bukia Komolafe and I'm the country manager of Travel Start in Nigeria. Cool. And my name is Philip Akerson. I'm the now the CEO of Travel Start. So I um, I look after Nigeria, South Africa and Egypt. And I used to be the country manager before Bukia took over. Uh, a few weeks ago. The glo global pandemic has uh, impacted on the travel tourism industry and across the yeah, across industries, but particularly on the travel um, tourism industry. Um, so how did you first react to the crisis when this whole thing started? Did you think it was going to be like, oh, okay, in a month we'll get through this? And um, yeah, so how did you react to the crisis? So I think the, um, the whole, the, whole um, the company reacted really swiftly. So I think it was early February, probably when, when this started, the COVID started to spread, the CEO had a big town hall with the whole group, uh, a big Zoom call for with every, every single country within the group and explained that this is probably going to be the worst crisis this industry has ever experienced. Uh, and that we should expect to see volumes decline by as much as ridiculous 50, 70% or mm -hmm. something along those lines. Now, naturally, as things unfolded, it became much worse than that. But even from that day one, we were very key just to in inform all staff exactly to um, what to expect, how each and every one of them could contribute to do the best of the situation. And then instantly start to save costs wherever we could save costs. So all contracts were renegotiated to, to limit spend as much as possible, preserve cash. And um, then we started to restructure the business because we realized that volumes would go down quite a bit so that it would be a great time to fix things um and do the best of the situation and come out of this as a better business mm -hmm. then of course um building better systems to help our customers out as well and uh, provide better information for them as well so they will feel comfortable in what was going on and we could help them as well as possible and if i could add to that one of the things that we also prioritized on the front lines was were our customers um so um i was one of the staff who was actually um i was on a work trip in, in south africa in cape town at our cape town office when I was caught by uh, the first wave of COVID when it hit South Africa. So it hit South Africa before it hit Nigeria. Um, and one of the things that we did very quickly as a company was prioritize customers who would be stuck um, in whatever destination they were in around the world. That meant helping them with their tickets, um, either opening up their tickets, helping to reroute them to a, um, another country, ensuring it got them safely. At that point in time around March, our, our the most our most important priority for our customers was getting them the right information that they needed there were a number of changes that were constantly happening with governments that were also making uh, very quick decisions and so we needed to make sure that we were nimble for our customers getting them the right information when they needed it so that they could get home safely or we could protect um, the cost of their ticket so they didn't lose out on that money yeah so where are you now in terms of um customer um management expectation so in terms of customer management our approach from day one or day zero has been proactive it is important to get people the information um, before you know they start panicking um, and one of the things that was really interesting about covid is that you know governments were also involved which meant that you could be for example so i was in south africa and you know the south africa government decided that they were going to shut down um, domestic travel versus in, in nigeria what we shut down first was international right before we yeah. shut down domestic yeah. so you were, we were constantly battling you know what are governments doing and then what and then what is that what will the impact then be on the airline and then ultimately the customer so again it was a very proactive approach one of the first things that we started doing was we would pull all the customers that were affected and we would send them an email out and we would let them know what they could do so it was really important for us to give people what their options were and then work with our customers to decide what was the best action for them. Now that you mentioned that, so there's um, a, a study that um, says 44% of international air travelers um, say they won't fly again until uh, maybe a vaccine is, you know, is found. 38% 38 said they won't fly domestic and 33% um, say they won't stay in um, a hotel. What does that mean for for your business, what does that say to you? Uh, I saw a similar report that came out just a few days ago by IOTA, and it says something along the lines of 10% of travelers are willing to travel right now. And about 50% of travelers would wait maybe up to six months or even the next six months. And then the remaining 40%, yeah, not before uh, six months, even with the vaccine, which basically means that 40% of the business this year should just be written off. 
So this will, of course, have a big impact on us. Uh, one of the biggest um, implications of how soon things will pick up again, of course, is the vaccine. But that's probably going to take a while. So um, there's a different scenario been outlined by EOTA as well, where their most optimistic scenario is that if we have a vaccine like now, now, then the most positive scenario is that by the end of the year, things might return to normal. Mm -hmm. But then a more likely scenario, according to them, is more mid, mid next year. And then the most pessimistic scenario means that if we, the vaccine is delayed and there's a second wave of corona and there's financial crisis and so on, then we're looking at 2023 for things to return to normal. So internally, what we are projecting um, is, okay, let's assume that we have maybe 15% of our volumes towards the end of the year. And then um, end of next year, we might have about 65% of volumes back uh, in the industry, in the industry as a whole. So those are the line, what we are looking um, to pro projecting, but it's, I mean, obviously impossible to say, but of course gonna have a, a long lasting big impact on us as a business and for our industry. Like I said, never let a good crisis go to waste. Yep. Um, so what we, what we did initially, it's just like I mentioned before, just cut all costs, review every single thing we could do. Because the last thing we wanted to do, of course, is to let go of, of staff. So the mm -hmm. first thing we do, it was to make sure everyone knew exactly how serious the situation was. And even if we thought maybe 50% of the volume would go down, that's significant enough. Like you need to make drastic changes to the business to maintain your profitability. So we did initially just make sure everyone knew what they could do to contribute to the survival of the business, but also to say, how can we save money and review every single thing. So a bit of like business detox, the way I look at it, which has been great. Every single contract has been renegotiated. And then we just use this hibernation mode, more or less, to go through and evaluate every single thing we do in the business, even on an architecture level, the infrastructure, how we collect data, how we, uh, the booking system, um, how our online marketing accounts are set up, every single thing from supply to distribution, everything is reviewed and to a large extent rebuilt in this period. So I think these changes would take normally two, three years to do if we would even do all of them. Uh, now we can do those maybe in six months. So in that sense, it is a bit of a silver lining, but I think for you to, it is important for you as a business to really make sure you use this time, you keep working hard and to fix things and to come out as a better business. Okay, now, so Buki, um, how do you think Tori's behavior will change um, in the light of all that's going? Okay, where can I go today and where will I continue to feel safe whilst I'm there? It might be, less about what they're going to actually go do there, but more about expressing their freedom. Um, and this is actually a campaign that we have come up with um, around May, where we're encouraging people to go back to the freedom to move. So yes, we know that we've all been confined by you know, the lockdown, several different stages of lockdown in all kinds of countries, but it's all about the freedom to move, freedom to learn from another culture, freedom to visit your family and friends, freedom to just enjoy your life and people really rekindling and I, I haven't seen my family or my friends in in x amount of time and i really miss them and therefore and so and then I'll, I'll go see them versus things i think things like festivals or um conferences um or at least large conferences and exhibitions i mean we, we're predicting that you're, we're not going to see that for a while at least in the format that we are used to everything is going to change, similar to how this interview you would have done in person, we are now doing online. Quite interesting. Okay, yeah, so one of the things we've also um, um, learned and um, also seen um, in the past few months, companies coming out to declare bankruptcy, companies, um, you know, um, saying they can no longer sustain their operations, some seeking bailouts, some have actually folded up. Um, for you, what would you say um, I know you may not want to give all this information, but what's your estimated um, loss, which is why I said estimated loss, like in this past few months? I think you can define loss in different ways, right? Um, we, um, from a global perspective, uh, air travel has gone down by 86% in June compared to June last year. Just to give you a sense, that's a global figure, but that's similar to what we're seeing in Nigeria as well. Even worse, actually. Um, the load factors in, in Africa, are the lowest have ever been and lowest in the world by far, about 16% load factor. Um, the second highest, I think, in South America is at twice that. So it's incredibly low at the moment. 
I mean, and I agree with Philip. I think when you when you think about loss, right? I think what we, we have to just know this: the entire world was brought to a standstill, um, in the sense that there was no air traffic. So I don't necessarily know if it if it matters as much as what is the exact amount. But the fact that we know globally there were barely any planes in the sky, I think you could look at you know companies like flight radar that would map out um, different airlines or when planes are in the sky and i think in april i think there was barely anything in the sky aside from you know cargo planes that were fun- so you've had them um, affiliate um or support businesses like say hotels airlines um lay off um staff or the bar staffs to to go home some might not even maybe return to their jobs in your own case um how have you been able to mitigate against you know uh, maybe laying off staff job losses how have you been able to mitigate against that i think it really started with doing the responsible thing as a business so initially as soon as we saw that there is going to be there's a big problem on the horizon then we took actions right away so when things when your house is on fire you can either call in the fire brigade right away or you can hope that you can put it out with a garden hose and take your chances right so we did we just call the fire brigade right away, called all the spend and informed staff early as to how serious this is looking. Mm-hmm. So by informing people early, they can also take action in their own roles to see how they could mitigate this to the extent possible. But then reducing all the spend we possibly could reduce so that the last resort for us was to reduce in, in staff size uh, and have to say good, goodbye to colleagues and friends. Um, at the end of the day with yeah, what we've seen, we had to say goodbye to a few staff. But it really, it started with just doing everything else we could. That was really the last resort. There was nothing else we could potentially do. And even throughout that process, inform everyone uh, exactly why we had to do the choices we, we had to do. Um, I think one of the things to also import, highlight, which is important, is that you know, when Philip first started talking, he said, you know, our plan started as early as February. And I think every month throughout, till really till, till today, I think, the impacts of COVID have just gotten worse and worse and worse. And I think the businesses that even had to make the decision to let go of staff, I don't think that that was anyone's first starting point. Um, you know, many organizations started with, okay, just work, let's all work from home, let's go on unpaid leave or, or a, a number of different um, other strategies before having to really realize that actually there, there is no job. Right. Um, so f- for us as a business, there, there are no uh, uh, tickets to issue. There are no tickets to cancel because there's nobody that's buying anything. Is it safe to fly now? And if it is safe, when? You know, are you ready for us? Are you beginning to get so, such um, queries? Absolutely. And I think what's important to say is I think throughout this period, not just in July, we've been getting questions every single month. It's just that the flavor of the question has changed. Before it was around, you know, cancellation and refunds or when can I travel? Now with domestic starting up July 8th, the question has been, okay, what airports are open? What, what airline can I fly from point A to point B? And what we have seen our role as is, is really that of amplification to help boost consumer confidence. So it's our job to make sure that our customers know when the airports are open, they know what the protocols are that they have to follow, they know how to book um, a flight safely. Um, You know, as as you rightfully mentioned, you know, we are an online travel agency. And so our way has always been, you know, socially socially distanced before socially distant became a thing. You know, it's always been about touchless travel. You download our app, Flap, or visit our website, right? Um, and make your booking before you go to the airport. Um, and so for us, it's been a really great way for our customers to feel safe and secure with, with our product because they know that it delivers 100% of the time on what we, have, what, what we promise. Um, at the same time, you know, the, the, the question that is probably the most frequent question that we probably get at least four times a day is, you know, when, is, when are international flights opening? Um, you know, how can I get back to my loved ones? And, you know, and we just follow very closely what the minister says. Um, and what NCAA says, and we make sure that our customers are aware of that. And, and where we can put our customers on repatriation flights, we are helping to organize that as well. So we haven't applied for any support at all. Um, and I think it's also, it's also tricky, you know, what, what should they do, what should they not do? I think all governments globally have, are facing incredible challenges at the moment, balancing the risk of other people and the virus, but also declining global economics. 
And so it's really difficult choice that are facing. Mm -hmm. um, what we've done instead, rather than rely on others, is to simply do whatever we can to fix our own business that's in our control. And then we have um, strong investors behind us who keep supporting us throughout this. So they provide additional funding to make sure we get through this uh, situation as well. So that's really what we have been doing. As far as what the government should be doing, I think Philip is absolutely correct. This is a decision between public health and global economy. And so I actually think there's a responsibility for every company to try and do what they can. And then for us to prioritize, as is being done in most countries, for the government to prioritize who actually needs a bailout and who doesn't need a bailout. I don't think anyone can survive this COVID-19's COVID impact by themselves. And so where we have partnered with investors, other businesses need to partner either with the government or a private sector or, or companies that are still giving grants out. Um, everybody, we all need to help ourselves so that we can help revive the overall economy. Um, I think if you only look at one source as, as the savior, um, you will quickly find out that even that money that you get from that source, you can get to, to September and it could have run out. And then what do you do? So it really is about taking a more holistic approach um, to the decision making and just looking at one source for, for the answer. Interesting. Okay, now, um, now that you, you, you mentioned um, that you've been part of um, um, maybe one or two repatriation flights. Yeah, so how, 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 how was that experience for you? Um, what new learnings did you take from, from that are going forward? Um, this may just be, uh, you know, um, the face of travel. Like, how was that experience? Or how was the experience like um, for you? The, um, there's a cooperation between the Nordic countries. So Sweden, Norway, Finland, Denmark, um, uh, to arrange a repatriation flight for the Nordic cities out of Nigeria, uh, flying to Denmark. So the, obviously with fewer staff on the airports, they uh, call in the, um, the consulates from each country to help to check people in, check that they had the right documentation and so on. So I think it, more than anything, it was a great experience and example of how countries can come together in these situations like this and help their citizens get back home and reunite with their loved ones. Mm -hmm. So I was at the airport with the um, other consuls and helping um, uh, yeah, check people in and uh, make sure that they got on their flights to uh, go back home. Just to clarify, so I don't think it was a corporate social responsibility initiative. Uh, nothing to do with, you know, what is the glory that is going to come from it, but the fact that we have passengers, customers, friends, family, colleagues stranded in a point and we need to get them from point A and we need to get them to point B. And so that means being on a call till midnight trying to find them a seat or going to the airport to help check people in by, by confirming their travel documents, we will make ourselves available. Mm -hmm. um, and with the global strength of travel start, you know, that's some of the, the differences in our competitive advantage that we can offer. We're not just focused on Nigeria, but we're focused on, on citizens all over the world. And, and we really, that's something that we hold very dear to our heart, because again, it's all about freedom to move. And if we can help to lubricate the system so that more people can move freely, um, we will happily provide the support. So in terms of um, local travel, we all know local travel is picking up um, again, um, domestic travel, um, so to speak, is picking up. So um, what are you seeing? Um, are you happy with um, what's been happening so far? Um, with the feedback you've also got, maybe from some of your partner airlines, I mean, from customers, uh, you know, are you, are you happy? Are things looking, looking up? Like um, we've established, things are gradually picking up, and, but some countries are still on lockdown. So a place like um, the US, for example, is still a no-go you know, no -go area. While in Dubai, um, for example, is almost like the place to be because they've opened up, um, they're inviting tourists to come, um, come into their country. South Africa, I think South Africa is still um on partial lockdown if i'm right yeah okay yeah so what are the things um for dubai for example what are those things that you've seen that they've done right so if you're going to to be advising um travelers or anyone who wants to book um, a trip right now what are you going to be advising them based on maybe what you've seen with the dubai for example or the things they need to consider um for someone who's hell-bent on saying oh no i want to go to south africa mm -hmm. What are those things you know you can? How can you better um, advise, so to speak? Yeah, how can you better advise them in terms of where to go, what to do, even hotels? 
so I again I think that it each each government has has had a different problem right everyone who has been evaluating the scale of the difference how do you balance public health versus opening up your economy I think at the very beginning of, of when countries started locking down I think the UAE probably had the strictest uh, lockdown procedures um, you know they even had tracking apps where you couldn't leave your apartment um, unless you you basically had to request to the government <laughs> to leave your apartment to go to go to point A and that was all around contact tracing and I think one of the things that now we are seeing that they did right because they were they are now able to open up right but before they opened up to the world one of the things that they did is they opened up locally first the same thing that we're doing in Nigeria we're opening up locally first we are getting um, our citizens to power our economy before we start opening up to other citizens of the world and I think that that's actually what we need to focus on and what we need to do we need to push local we need to push local travel. We need to push people going, not just to Abuja and Potakot, but you know, going to Kano, going to Kaduna and seeing more of, of the beauty of this country. Um, I think if we continue to rely on international travel or as in a Nigerian visiting, you know, the US, the UK, et cetera, then, you know, we're, I think we're gonna miss part of the beauty of this crisis, which is an, actually an opportunity for us to grow local and, and, and really showcase to one another the beauty of, of being a Nigerian and, and the value behind every other city. So for me, that's actually how I look at it. Philip, I don't know if you have anything else to add. Maybe on the domestic travel, some of the best travel memories I've had ever, anywhere, is actually some of the domestic travel I've done in Nigeria. Like visiting Durabar and Kano and Kaduna, um, just doing the drive from Abuja to Jos is just stunning. Mm. Um, watch Dombe boxing in Abuja. I mean, so many incredible experiences I've had in Nigeria just traveling domestically. Mm -hmm. um, now I heard that uh, Durban was canceled in Kano, uh, yeah. which probably makes sense. Mm. But it's, um, there is so much to see here domestically as well. And I think this is actually a good opportunity for people to, to see that as well. And I believe that we have about 24 domestic airports that are now open. Um, as of the 24th of July. And, you know, the minister is working very hard on opening up more um, airports. So let's not lose the opportunity or lose sight of what we do have because we're so focused on what we don't have, um, which could actually cause us to have even more issues from a safety and a public health perspective. Let's actually focus on what we do have. So now for hotels, um, tourist um, destinations, for example, what feedback are you get, getting um, do you think some of them are ready, especially um, with the health guidelines? Um, you, what feedback are you getting? Are they really ready? The airlines, yeah, can be ready. But how about, mm -hmm. you know, um, destinations, hotels? What feedback are you getting from those affiliates and businesses? So the feedback that we're getting from hotels is, again, that they are also ready. So and we have to understand this. For a hotel to begin to advertise, um, openly, they must have passed some health and safety procedures as dictated by their government or local governments in whatever city that they are in. So again, our job is to amplify some of those messages. So, you know, if we look at, you know, and again, I'll pick a local destination. If we look at the Transcorp Hilton in Abuja, you know, they have been very open about what they have specifically done, like, you know, how they're locking the room. So after the room has been clean, you know, there's now a safety label on the room. And when you go, go to the hotel and you're checking into your room, you will see a safety label, et cetera. You know, when we had conversations with, you know, the Radisson in, in Dubai, they also have similar protocols. Not only do they have that, they've also even limited sort of the number of people that can be in a hotel. And because the demand isn't very high, they're increasing their personalization, right? Um, so, Bumi, you are going to the hotel before where, you know, people would be worried about, oh, can I use the, the toiletries? What they're doing is they're personalizing it. So it will say Bumi. So you know that that was especially for you. Uh, how many other people in the world are called Bumi or at least are coming at this very specific time? So those are some of the things that even hotels are doing to increase confidence, to let people know that, you know what, this is not a one size fits all. This was specially curated and personalized for you. You know, we're seeing, and not to go back to the airlines, but you know, even for the airlines, you know, Virgin Atlantic, for example, is putting a pillow in the middle that says, you know, for your safety, there's thus signifying that this middle seat will not be occupied throughout the flight. Emirates has done a number of uh, initiatives around global cover. Um, you know, again, helping people to feel com comfortable and confident. 
And what our role is uh, as Travel Start is, is really to help amplify these messages mm. so as to help boost consumer confidence. That is what we will continue to do and that is how we will continue to reinforce for customers what, where they can and cannot book. We go the extra mile as well is that even before we ticket um, your booking, we will call you and also have a conversation with you around are you aware of all of the safety protocols? Are you aware of the travel documents that are required? Are you aware of these things? So again, just another way to go the extra mile just to show customers that we are ready for them and everyone in the ecosystem that has been given the okay is ready for them. Now, um, so you know, there are um, small businesses, small um, um, business will also depend on you, on, on you guys. So all your images of this world will package um, tours. Are there going to be incentives for them going forward, knowing that um, they've taken a beating, just like you've taken a big hit to in the last few months? So, are there packages, for example, for them, you know, going forward to, you know, kind of encourage them so that they can, um, yeah, so that they can remain in business? So, are you working on anything? I think everything is, is always in, in the works. I think for, for us, what we've specifically done for, you know, our 6,000 small businesses that, that rely on us to provide great travel deals is to continue to pay commission where we can. Um, and that has been something that we have maintained as a company to do is paying their commission to ensure that they can still survive and that they still have some revenue coming in. So if you continue as an affiliate, if you continue to, to book a flight, whether it is domestic or, you know, international, um, where, where applicable, we will pay commission. Um, we are also keeping them updated around refunds. Because as you rightly said to me, we've all gone through this, you know, 86%, if not more, decline um, in revenue. So the, the truth is, it's not even about what are, what are we doing? It's also about like, what is, what is the ecosystem? What is available? If you don't have a customer who wants to use the product, all of our businesses are dead. The end. Um, so for, the, for those who are able to still find customers, we're supporting them with commission. For those who are, are sort of gearing up, what we're doing is going back for them and, and taking a look and seeing, okay, was there any, any commission that was outstanding that we could potentially pay now because it was unclean? You know, trying to help in, 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 in those types of ways, if possible. But again, it, it's a very difficult situation for everybody in the ecosystem. And we are trying our best to help in whatever way that we can. I mean, it's an important distribution channel. And just like I mentioned before, we are evaluating everything in our business, how we do things. And these 6,000 small businesses are a big chunk of our business. And I think it will be an even larger part of our business going forward. I think we'll see more consolidation in the industry. And um, I think looking at ways how we can serve these better, not only by you know, how can we offer them better commissions, but also how can we give them better tools to help them do the trade more effectively. Mm-hmm. So in terms of, instead of competing with them, we give them better tools to do the trade. And by doing yeah. so, we'll help them to grow. And by doing so, then we help build a stronger travel ecosystem. And that's really what we want to do. And one mm-hmm. of the things that we're working on as well in this hibernation phase. 